Hi, welcome to our broadcast on the CW from Good Hope Church. I'm Pastor Mike, and we are in the middle of our vision series. Every year, and sometimes twice a year, we talk about the basic vision of the church. Why are we here? What are we trying to accomplish? And we put together just a simple vision statement, which is reach up, rise up, reach out. And it's the the litmus test that if we're doing something, does it fit into one of those categories? If we have a strategy for ministry, does it help us uh, along one of those three lines? And so we always focus on staying on task because as Zig Ziglar put it so many years ago, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And that's what we're trying to do. We want to stay uh, busy connecting with God, growing in our faith, and making a difference in this world. So this week we're on part two, Rise Up, of our vision series. I hope you get something good out of part two, Rise Up. I'm going to introduce our one-minute blessing time. Every service we pray together. I believe when God's people pray, the hand of God moves. For whatever reason, God has seen fit to uh, allow us to pray, and then He responds. I'm, I'm not sure if that's a good strategy or not, but he does that. And so when God's people pray, it moves the hand of God. And so each service we pray together for a particular ministry, for a need, whatever the case may be. And this week, I want to pray for next weekend. Next weekend, there's some really awesome things going on in Cloquet. Friday and Saturday at the Armory is the Feed My Starving Children mobile food packing event. So over $22,000 has been raised and 500 volunteers are ready to go to make it all happen at the Armory Friday and Saturday. A fantastic event going on there. And then on Sunday is the God's Work Our Hands event. And that's where churches come together uh, and then go out into the community and do service projects together. And so both of those events are churches working together to make a difference in our community and around the world. So the Feed My Starving Children mobile food packing event, fantastic thing. And then the God's Work Our Hands thing, really, really great. But it's about churches working together. Amen? When God's people work together, amazing things happen. When God's people don't work together, amazing things don't happen. And so we need to stand together as the body of Christ, and it's a really awesome thing. One of the things that's going on in Cloquet is we've got several churches growing at the same time. Yeah, we've got probably five churches right now that are growing in Cloquet at the same time. Now, that means that it isn't people switching and going here and there and finding the flavor of the week. It means that God is doing something and that we're all coming up together. And that's an incredible, wonderful thing. And the reason that happens here is because the churches work together. The churches love and support each other. The pastors pray for each other. It's, it's just, it's a good thing. We know we're on the same team serving God. Maybe different flavors, maybe different perspectives on some things, but we've got something more important that's in common than the things that separate us. And so we stand together for, for, the, uh, for the glory of God. And so let's pray for the Feed My Starving Children event and the, uh, um, the God's Work Our Hands event. And let's also pray for the body of Christ to stand unified for God's glory. So pray with me if you would. Heavenly Father, first we give you thanks for churches working together to be able to accomplish things for your kingdom. We thank you for the Feed My Starving Children mobile food packing event and for the God's Work Our Hands event, Lord, uh, reaching out into the world and reaching into our community to do uh, good things, ministries of love and compassion into this world. Lord, thank you for those things. And Father, we, we thank you for the unity of the believers and the unity between churches here in the Cloquet area. What an amazing blessing that is that that we have so many churches that understand that when we stand together, we are all stronger together. 
And so, Father, we pray that that unity would continue to increase, continue to bear fruit for your kingdom, and that your hand of blessing would be upon all the churches that are trusting in you, Lord, not just in this area, in this region, but around the world. Lord, let your hand be upon us that we may glorify you together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, we are continuing our vision series. We got a three-week series on vision, reach up, rise up, reach out. And then the the last weekend in September, Pastor Corey from Morgan Park is going to come here and preach. And I'm going to go to Morgan Park and preach there. And that's going to be fantastic. So Pastor Corey uh, and the whole team there in Morgan Park will have their one-year anniversary of the starting of the church next week. So, yeah, they're going to have a big celebration, and then the following week he'll be here and tell you a bunch of stuff that's been going on and preach a good word here in uh, in Cloquet. Uh, And I'm just thrilled with how things are going over there. You know, they're fighting a battle. When we first were starting to arrange things so that we could plant a church in Morgan Park, there were three struggling churches in that community. Then they tore down the Catholic church. And uh, uh, another little church closed, and by the time we started, there was only one other church there. And so then we started, now we're back to two. I mean, we need to be at five, right? But we're at, we're at two, so that's good. And we've got people coming, and God's doing things, so you want to be here in two weeks and hear how it's going in Morgan Park and hear Pastor Corey's heart and the stories he's got to tell. God's been doing good stuff. So... With our vision series, last week we talked about reaching up, so we've got reach up, rise up, reach out, and we do hand motions with these on Sunday morning. So, you know, usually it's kids' church where they do hand motions, but we do hand motions in here, and there's a specific reason why I have us do hand motions. It's because it seems a little awkward, but if we can work together on something that simple, maybe God will allow us to work together on something more important. Maybe God will allow us to come together and fund a children's home in another country. Maybe God will allow us to come together and help that children's home become financially independent so we don't have to fund it anymore. Maybe God will help us reach communities with campus churches that aren't really able to support churches on their own and provide the structure and everything so that people can just minister in their communities and get some work done. Maybe God will let us do those things if we can work together on simple things like hand motions. So, I'll show you the hand motions. If you know them, you can do them with me. But later, we'll have an opportunity to all do the hand motions together. So we've got reach up, which is a real relationship with the living God is available to you. We can have that connection with God. We must reach up to God and maintain that connection. And then rise up. A real relationship with the living God will change you. You rise up out of the junk that's been holding you down into who God has truly called you to be. And then reach out. Your life has purpose and meaning, and there are things that only you can do, and you can be a light for Christ. A real relationship with the living God is a call to action. So let's do these things together. Here we go, everybody. Reach up, rise up, reach out. Oh, you did very well. That's fantastic. So (laughs) kind of a little goofy thing, but it allows us to work together on something. And if there's something that Christians need to do, it's work together. Because when we work together underneath the plan of God, there's no one can stop us. Amen? The gates of hell will not prevail. But if we implode from the inside, we're done before we start. So working together is where it's at. Last week, we talked about reaching up, connecting with God, and a real relationship with the living God is available to you. And I asked Pastor Corey, hey, what is the most important thing people need to know about reaching up to God? And he said, well, I think the thing that people need is a tangible experience with God. And so uh, last week, we talked about three examples from the Bible of people who lived their life and had experiences with God so that we could see what are the possibilities and what might my experience with God be like. We talked about Samuel, who was the classic insider who had every advantage. He was uh, an answer to prayer from a high priest. He was dedicated to service to God at his birth. He was 
put in the temple to serve the Lord from the time that he was a toddler and he slept next to the Ark of the Covenant of God. He was an insider who had every opportunity and God came and spoke to him and made him a mighty prophet for the whole nation. He had a tangible experience with God when he was just a kid. Then we talked about the Canaanite woman, the opposite of Samuel. The woman who had every disadvantage, who was of a rejected class of people, who was ignored and shunned by Jesus for a time, but she fought through that and was able to get her miracle. She had a tangible experience with God being the disadvantaged, rejected, pushed aside person. And then we talked about the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch had an incredible experience with God through another person. Through Philip, who came and explained the word of God to him, and then he was baptized and went serving God from then on out. He had a tangible, beautiful experience with God, but it came through a person. So we saw the insider's experience with God, the outsider's experience with God, and the people whose experience with God comes through others. This week, we're talking about rising up, about getting better at serving God. A real relationship with the living God will change you. So let's pray, and we'll get into new material here this morning. So holy, holy God, thank you for putting your word in our hands. Thank you for putting your scriptures in our hands that we could read your word, that we could see your truth. Lord, you knew that your word would be misunderstood, it would be misused, it would even be used for bad things, but Lord, you saw fit to put it in our hands. We want to honor your word and see it for what it really says and and believe your truth fully and honestly. Lord, I know each one in this place needs something different from you, but your word is living and active, so I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would just Touch each one of us with just what we need, the thing we need to believe in you, to trust you more, to, uh, to walk in your ways more effectively, to bear more fruit for your kingdom, to have joy instead of sadness, whatever it is that we need. Lord, I know by your spirit you can touch each one of us with, with just that. So that's what I ask of you. Do bless our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Rise up. A real relationship with the living God will change you. God expects you to grow and get better. Amen? He's expecting you to grow and get better. Now, that's good for you, and it's good for him. You know, when you grow and get better, your life gets better. When you grow and get better, you're able to be more effective and productive in the kingdom of God as well. So it's good for everybody. We want to grow and we want to get better. People want their lives to change, but oftentimes they don't personally want to change. But here's the deal. If you want your life to change, you're the one who's going to have to change. You're the one who's going to have to grow and get better, get you know, rise up out of all the junk, all the negative things that are pulling you down, the, the things that have happened to you that you can't get free from. We want to break free from that and rise up into who God truly called us to be, have the character, the heart, the vision of God, and walk into His calling for us. We want to uh, rise up. God expects it, and He is there to help us change and become who we're supposed to be. Now, We have an order of the vision statement, reach up, rise up, reach out. And that's based on the idea that, you know, who needs, uh, your what qualifications do you need to have to reach up to God? None, right? Doesn't matter what sin you're in the middle of, it doesn't matter where you've been, it doesn't matter your lineage or what you know, all you you just reach up to God, He's there to receive you, That's, that's it. Then we're called to grow. We're called to get the plank out of our own eye. Jesus said that, you know, get the plank out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So we rise up. That's getting the plank out of our own eye so that we'll see clearly to be able to reach out and make a difference. Then we can take the speck out of our brother's eye. So connect with God. That's open to anybody. Once you connect with God, now start getting better. And then you'll be able to make a real difference for the kingdom of God. Craig Groeschel, a pastor of Life Church, has a core value in their church, and basically it goes like this. He says, um, Christians don't go to church. Christians are the church. You don't go to church. You are the church. And the church isn't here for you. The church is here for the world. 
So you are the church, and the church is here for the world. Christians don't go to church. They are the church. And the church isn't here for you, but we are the church, and we are here for the world. So we are called to have that connection with God, to rise up and get stronger, and then to make a real difference in this world. So this is discipleship. I don't hear people talk about discipleship a whole lot anymore. The thing they talk about less is sanctification. That's the fancy biblical word for getting good at following Jesus, is sanctification. It means that the junk that you got uh, when you came to Christ is now fallen off and the good things of God are in. That's sanctification. It's also discipleship. It's the process of getting good at being a Christian. One of the things that's a very frustrating life is a long-term, incompetent Christian life. It's very frustrating and painful. You see all the promises of God, but you don't get any of them. And, it, and you don't make any difference. And you just keep falling down over and over again. It's frustrating and painful because you see the possibilities, but you never get to have them. What we want to do is be learning and growing and getting better so we can grab hold of the goodness of God. This is discipleship. It's sanctification. And let me tell you this. God sees great potential in you. Amen? He sees enough potential in you to go to the cross for you, that you could be forgiven and brought into relationship with Him so that your future wouldn't be hindered by your past. He sees great potential in you or He would never have done that. I tell you, God is real smart. Amen? So Jesus didn't go to the cross on a mistake because He just didn't realize you were that bad. No, he knew that there was great potential in you, and that's why he went to the cross. So believe that you have great potential and rise to the occasion. A real relationship with the living God will change you. Let's outline the process that Jesus went through for discipleship in Bible times. So Jesus had a process of making disciples, of taking somebody who didn't believe and bringing them into a place of understanding who he was and being launched into a new life. This process, the simply put, I believe has four parts. Part number one, he called people. He said, come follow me. Part two, he taught people. He taught people by using words and telling parables and explaining different things. He taught people through example of what he did. He taught people through showing the power of God. He taught people. Then he gave people opportunities to serve in a controlled environment, in a safe environment where if they made mistakes, he was there to help them. And then Jesus released people to go do their ministry And to be the leaders. So he called them. He taught them. He gave them opportunities. And he released them. Now what's the response of those who went through this process successfully? Well, when Jesus called, they answered the call. When Jesus said, come follow me, they said yes and they went There were those who said no, and there were those who said yes. Just like in today's world, there are those when Jesus calls, they say, no, I'm going with you. And there are those who say, yes, I'm in. What's the correct answer? The correct answer is, yes, I'm in. (laughs) That's the right answer. And the answer is, yes, I'm in today. Yes, I'm in right now. Not, yes, I'll be in a couple decades from now. You know, like, oh, when they build the temple and I'm pretty sure Jesus is coming back, then I'll get right with God. No, get right with God now. Now's the time. So when Jesus called, they said, yes, I'm in. They left their past and they went into their future with Christ. Then they devoted themselves to the teachings of Jesus. Now, we have the Holy Scriptures. We can devote ourselves to the teachings. We can learn and see what God has for us By looking through the scriptures and seeing what's there, we can also devote ourselves to the teachings of Christ. Then when uh, when Jesus gave them opportunities, they stepped out in a controlled environment. Here in the church, we've got all kinds of little volunteer opportunities in a controlled environment where you can serve the Lord. And then Jesus released them to lead. And oh man... 
like Pastor Corey in Morgan Park. Part of the congregation. Took his Minsom classes. Got his, you know, certificate of ministry. And then we sent him to the town he lives in to plant a church there and minister to people there. Release to lead. We have all of those opportunities today just like they did in Jesus' day. Now, to make this a little more personal, let's look at this process through the life of Peter. Peter the apostle, Peter one of the 12 disciples, Peter who went from being one type of person into a relationship with Jesus that had lots of ups and downs and into mighty and amazing service to the Lord. So let's look at Peter's life, and then let's think about our lives as we do that. We go to Luke chapter 5, where Jesus calls Peter. Luke 5, starting in verse 1. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. So the fishermen had been out all night. Now they're cleaning their nets up, getting ready to end the day. They're taking care of their their equipment. Verse 3, he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon. So Simon is Peter. He got a new name. We'll talk about how he got that new name. But back in Bible times, a lot of the situations were that, that people, when they stepped into that new life in Christ, they got a different name. And they identified with their new life more than they identified with their old life, so they got a new name. You know, the Bible says when we go to heaven, we'll get a new name. You ever wonder what your name will be? It's going to be a good name. It's going to be a good name. But this Simon, that's Peter, he's a fisherman who owns a boat that Jesus borrows so he can go offshore a little bit and teach the crowds. He got in one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Verse 4, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. So he'd been preaching in Simon's boat, and he says to Simon, all right, why don't you do a little bit more fishing? You've been cleaning your nets, you're getting the sticks and the seaweed out, you didn't catch any fish, but you know, you got them all cleaned out, why don't you get them dirty again? Verse verse 5, Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. What's what's Simon thinking? You know, he's probably thinking things like, okay, you do the preaching, I'll do the fishing. Let's just stick to the things we're good at here. It's not fishing time. The sun's out. It's late in the morning. I'm tired. I want to go to bed. But something happened. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Because you say so. Peter submitted to the request of Jesus, the command of Jesus, the instruction of Jesus. I've heard it said, you can't submit until you disagree. If you agree with what someone is saying and they're they're asking you to do something, then you're just doing what you want to do. But it's only when you disagree with someone who has authority over you that you're able to submit to that authority. So if you agree with everything and then the one time you don't, you don't do it, you haven't submitted yet. However, Peter, he says, this is not the time to let down the nets. This is foolish, but you said so, so I'm going to. He's disagreeing and submitting. So verse 6 When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partner in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. So that's a pretty good fishing day. This is the best payday that Peter's ever had in his life. If this happened regularly, they'd build bigger boats. So this is fantastic. What is Peter's response to this? When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away. Here's a man who all of a sudden knew he was in the presence of someone holy, 
someone from God. And his response wasn't, hallelujah, what a bunch of fish. He's thinking, fish don't do this. I'm a fisherman. Fish don't do this. This is a miracle that God is here. And he says to Jesus, go away from me. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Peter's first response in recognizing that Jesus was more than a man with interesting things to say was, I don't belong here. I don't belong where you are. You need to get away before I burst into flames, man. you, You need to go. He didn't feel worthy to be in the presence of the Lord. He saw Jesus as, at the very least, a mighty man of God. I don't know if he had the full revelation at this point, but he knew he didn't belong there. So he tells Jesus to go away. But Jesus didn't go away. Verse 9. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. You may have heard of those guys before. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. Simon, who is Peter, says to Jesus, go away from me, Lord. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. He says, don't be afraid. I got a plan for you. You feel like you don't belong. You feel like that I I need to leave you because you're a sinful man and that you can't be in the presence of a holy God. But I've got a plan for you. Don't be afraid. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And the last verse we'll read. Verse 11. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. So did Peter keep the catch of fish? No. No. He kept the one who produced the catch of fish. He kept the one who could change his life forever rather than kept a batch of fish. He left the fish with Zebedee or whoever, and they had a good time with that. But Peter said, I'm going with this Jesus. He answered the call. Peter listened to what Jesus had to say. Then Peter trusted and obeyed when Jesus said to let down the nets. Then Peter saw the power of God and he left everything to follow Jesus. Peter answered the call. Then Peter followed Jesus. I mean, he, he lived with him. He followed him. In those days, uh, uh, the rabbi would gather disciples, and, and it'd be like going to school, you know, moving to college or something, and you'd go be under that teacher. And so Peter was under that teacher, under Jesus, for three, three and a half years, for, for quite a while, every day. And so what do you think it would be like to live under the teaching of Jesus for a day? Do you think it would be equivalent to, say, doing your morning devotions and going to church and then in the evening attending a small group? Maybe a little more than that, right? But if we made it equivalent with that, it would be like going to church every week, going to your small group every week, and doing your devotions for 21 years. This is a pretty serious, intensive training time. So Peter is being taught by Jesus for these three years plus. And Peter does some great things. When Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Which is the great question that each of us is faced with. Who is Jesus? Then they gave him the the different rumors that were going around. You're some dude that was reincarnated, you know, or this or that, and, and some bizarre answers. And then Jesus says, but who do you say I am? And Peter, because when things enter his mind, they come out his mouth, which is why it's so nice to read the stories of Peter, because we don't have to wonder what he was thinking. He just said it. He says, you're the Christ, you're the Son of God. And Jesus says, that wasn't revealed to you by man. You didn't figure that out yourself. God showed you that. And then he says, now your name is Rock. Because that's the translation of the word Peter. So it wasn't, he was named Rock. Like if it was in English, his name would be Rock. It was the, na- it was the word Rock in their language. 
It wasn't a name that meant rock. You know what I mean? He just called him rock. Now you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's a victory, amen? Later in that chapter, Jesus is talking about going to the cross and all the difficulties he's going to face. And Peter says, no, 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 that's not going to happen to you. Nothing like that's going to happen to you. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So he's renamed Rock, and then he gets a, get behind me, Satan. He calls him Satan. There's some ups and downs. You know, Peter's the one that denied Jesus three times when he's being tried and crucified. Peter had some ups and downs. He had some great times with the Lord and great victories. And he had some profound difficulties as well. That's a picture of us. During that time where Peter's having his ups and downs. He had an up and down at the same time in a situation where Jesus gave him an opportunity in a controlled environment. He let Peter uh, try something while Jesus was there to make sure it all worked out. Let's go to Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 22, and let's look at this situation. So, Jesus and his disciples have been ministering to masses of people. I mean, like huge big tent revival stuff. Masses of people. They're really tired. So Jesus says, look, you guys need to get in the boat. You need to take off. I'll take care of the crowds. I'll get them all squared away. And then this is what transpires from there. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So maybe late afternoon sometime, Jesus says, look, you guys need to just go. You know, you need need to get away from this. I know we're all tired. Go ahead and go. So he sends them out. And then Jesus dismisses the crowd. And then he goes up on a mountainside and prays. So time is passing here. Then it gets dark. And there... Rowing the boat against the waves, and they're not making a whole lot of progress. It's a big lake. They're trying to get to the other side, but they're rowing in the middle of the night, and they're not getting very far. During the fourth watch of the night, I looked this up. I found three watches. I don't know when the fourth watch is, but it's late. You were looking four in the morning, something like that. Late. So they left maybe four in the afternoon. Maybe they've been rowing for 12 hours. It was light when they started. It's almost getting light now. And they're pulling. You ever been real tired? Now, let's read what happened. During the fourth what? Oh, no, I'm sorry, back that. I almost was done with half of that one. Sorry about that. It's a, the camera people have to chase me around too. You know, it's, it's, it's tough on them. Sometimes I'll do one of these and they're like, oh, don't do that. But... <laughs> During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Have you ever been somewhere and you thought you were alone and then you look and there's a person standing there? Did that ever freak you out? Have you ever had that happen in the dark? Have you ever had that happen out on a lake? A person out on the lake? They're rowing for half a day. They're tired. It's dark. There's a storm. They don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden there's a person out on the lake. They're like, ah, verse, next verse. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. So he he startled them, he kind of snuck up on them. They freaked out a little bit. He said, look, it's okay, it's me. Don't be afraid. Verse 28, Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Apparently, Peter's not quite sure yet. Like, I don't know. He's still a little scared. If it is you, tell me to come out. Verse 29. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Now, Jesus walking on the water, I can picture that in my mind. Amen. He's he's the Son of God. He's the Alpha and the Omega. You know, I mean, he was fully man, but 
fully God too, was Peter gets out of the boat, starts walking on the water. Not too bad. The only like normal person to walk on water is Peter. But this isn't the end of the story. When he's in the boat, he's got a certain type of courage. You know, there's in the boat courage and there's out of the boat courage. Peter starts the process with in the boat courage. He gets out of the boat and something else happens. Come, he said, I messed you up again. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. So he's got in the boat courage. He gets out of the boat. It's working good. Then he realizes he has out of the boat, and he's got on the lake courage, which he starts to sink because he's afraid of what's going on. And he says, Lord, save me. I love the next word, verse 31, immediately, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. He lifts him up. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? He caught him. He said, that was was pretty good. He could have got farther though. Pretty good. You know, Jesus didn't just watch him and be like, you have little faith, you know. (laughs) He catches him. It's a controlled environment. Peter can step out, and when he starts to sink, Jesus is there. All right, buddy, let's get you back up here. You see what faith can do? You need a little bit more. You can do some mighty things. He rescued him immediately. He didn't hesitate And an amazing thing about this section of Scripture is Jesus didn't tell Peter to come out of the boat. Peter asked Jesus if he could get out of the boat. So here's my question for you. What are you asking Jesus for the ability to do? Peter asked Jesus, if that is you, let me come out on the water. What do you got in your life? Lord, if that is you, help me to do whatever it is. Help me overcome this situation. Help me. What are you asking God for the power and ability to do? Peter answered the call. He devoted himself to the teachings of Jesus. And he had his ups and downs. And he tried things in controlled environments. And then Jesus released him. You know, Jesus, we talked about the three, three and a half years. It's because Jesus was crucified, he died, he was buried, he rose again, and then he ascended into heaven. When Jesus was crucified, Peter was denying him three times. He was scared out of his mind. Now, Peter was not afraid to die. Remember, he took a sword and he whacked a guy's ear off. When you knock a guy's ear off with a sword, you're not going for the ear. You know what I mean? He's going to crack him right down the skull. And the guy dodged a little bit and he cut off his ear. I mean, he was ready to die in battle for Jesus. He didn't know how to live for Jesus. He didn't know how to put the sword away and not fight and love people. He wasn't sure how to do that part. So it was very confusing to him. And so now he's denying the Lord because he's all confused. He doesn't know what to do. And he denies the Lord three times at the crucifixion time. And then uh, he's, he's... heart is broken, and Jesus restores him, and then we're talking like six weeks later is the day of Pentecost, and the church is born, the New Testament church is born, and who is the main figure at the birth of the New Testament church? It's Peter. Acts chapter 2, verse 14, it's the day of Pentecost, there's people from all over the region that speak all these different languages, all these different nationalities have converged on Jerusalem and God has done a mighty miracle where the the 120 in the upper room, the Holy Spirit falls on them and they're able to speak the languages of all these people and tell of the wonders of God and everybody's confused as to what's happening and Peter stands up and he gets everyone's attention and they listen to him. 
Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. They quieted down and they listened. And he's speaking to thousands of people all at once. I had the, the blessing of being able to go over to Albania. One of the things that around here, like you think, how do you speak to thousands of people without electronics? Over there, there's all these natural amphitheaters and there's not many trees. It's kind of open. You know, like there's, you can see how it could happen. It's an amazing thing. God used that geography as part of his plan. But Peter stands up, he quiets the crowd, and then he preaches a message. We're not going to read the whole message, but we're going to cut to the conclusion of it. We're jumping to verse 36. This Peter, who was afraid to be in the presence of Jesus, is now released to do amazing ministry. Verse 36. Therefore, Peter says, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Who crucified Jesus? Why did he go to the cross? I tell you, I got a piece in it. He went there for me, so who crucified Jesus? He went there for you, so who crucified Jesus? He went there for us. He didn't go there because he couldn't overcome the Romans. He went there for us. We have a part in that. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? So Peter, who is called by Jesus, now calls others. What shall we do? Verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. So repent be baptized in the name of Jesus. Your sins will be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So this promise is for everyone. It's for them that were there. It's for those in the future. It's for those who weren't there and for everybody. That includes us. Verse 40. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Peter, the denying Peter, the get behind me Satan Peter, the go away from me Lord, I'm a sinful man Peter, has stepped up into something new. And he gets to be used by God as a catalyst to the birth of the New Testament church and in one speech bring 3,000 people to Christ. That's amazing. 3,000 were added to their number that day. I'm going to invite the prayer teams up. We're going to close here in just a minute. Peter didn't start his ministry on the day of Pentecost. Peter didn't start his relationship with Jesus on the day of Pentecost. Peter started years before as someone, a fisherman, just a normal guy. God saw some promise in him just like he sees promise in you. And Jesus called him and he learned and he grew and he found some things, made some mistakes and he had his victories and then he was released by God to do amazing things. You know, not all of us will get to be in a position where we get to call 3,000 people to Christ in one moment. But all of us have a purpose in Christ. All of us can answer the call and be used by God in mighty ways. Peter saw what 2 Corinthians 5.17 meant. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Simon is gone, and Peter is here. The old is gone, the new has come. Now, this is both instantaneous and progressive. When we reach up to God and we put ourselves in Christ, then we are perfectly forgiven even though we're not perfect. 
Amen? But then progressively over time, we rise up. We get the plank out of our eye. We see how to walk by faith and not be shaken so often. And we get better and we make progress. And then we're released. Last week, we talked about choosing to answer God's call. Between the Sunday services and the youth group, we had 22 hands up saying, yeah, I want to follow Jesus or I want to recommit my life to Christ. Last night and 9 o'clock, 15 more. I think God's doing something. So I'm going to allow the opportunity to say yes to Jesus here as well. And then I want all of us to try to live out Ephesians 4.1. In Ephesians 4, verse 1, the Apostle Paul is talking to the church in Ephesus. Paul has been a diligent servant of God. He knows what it's like for the old to be gone, the new to come. He's the one who wrote 2 Corinthians 5.17. And uh, he's now in prison for his service to Christ. And he says this to the church in Ephesus. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. For those who have received the calling, who have said, yes, Lord, I'm in, then we endeavor to live a life worthy. Let's pray along those two lines, and then I'll invite people up for personal prayer. We've got the prayer teams here ready to go, whatever the need is. Uh, When we're done praying together, come on up for personal prayer Uh, Again, whatever the need is, come get prayer. If you need a physical healing, you need a relationship restored, you need wisdom and understanding what you should do in a situation, a financial miracle, whatever it is, come get prayer. But let's pray along these lines first together. Heavenly Father, you are so good. Thank you for your kindness and your mercy. Thank you that you see potential in us and that you have paid a price to set us free. Lord, step one is answering the call, is, is saying, yes, Lord, I'm in. So let's, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give the opportunity for people to raise their hands. I'm not going to call you up front, but I want you to have a moment in time where you raise your hand and say, yes, Lord, I'm in. If that's you, if you need to say, yes, Lord, I'm in, or you need to say, yes, Lord, I'm in again, I want you to raise your hand. It's one, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine. All right, you can put your hands down. Let's pray together for these nine. Heavenly Father, thank you for people who who you've seen raise their hand to say, yes, they're in. So, Father, let your blessings fall upon them. Let your goodness come in. Lord, let the, the old be gone and the new come. And Father, for each of us, Lord, help us to live a life worthy of the call. Help us to rise up into newness of life, to not be held back by sin and darkness, but to be set free and to walk into newness of life. Just as Peter had his ups and downs, his his failures, but his victories, Lord, let us not quit. Peter kept going. Let us continue and run the race, learning the lessons, but leaving the past in the past and going forward to the things that are in front of us. Let us live a life worthy of the call. Father, I pray that your peace would fall upon us. Lord, that instead of anxiety and fear, that we would be filled with peace. Lord, I pray that right now that your joy would come upon us. Lord, instead of sorrow, that your joy would be our strength. Lord, instead of depression and just a a heaviness, that you would bring us into that joy and that peace that uh, passes all understanding and allows us to be a light for you in this world. Lord, I pray that you would give us a revelation of how much you love us and the potential you see in us. Lord, so that we can be filled up with that, filled up with your love so that we have extra love in our hearts to share with those that we interact with that are difficult to deal with. Lord, bless us in that way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Well, that was uh, some interesting stuff about rising up, that a real relationship with the living God will change you. We've got a couple of questions to address here, and so let me read the first one, and we'll talk about it. This question is, if God loves me just the way I am, why do I need to change? Well, you know, that's an excellent question. I've heard that many times, and the truth is, God does love you just the way you are. But God loves you so much that He wants you to get better. He wants your life to be better than what it is. And if you're, uh, let's say that you're really at a rock bottom situation and, you know, everything in your life is falling apart and you're miserable and depressed and, and you're really hurting in a very deep way, God loves you right in that place, absolutely, but He loves you so much that He wants to get you out of that place. He wants to get you into a place where you're really enjoying life and uh, being productive for His kingdom. So that's, that's what God wants for you. He wants your life to be better. So that's a big reason why you have the opportunity to change for, uh, you know, through the Lord's power. And the other main reason why we need to change, even though God loves us right where we are, is because God has a plan and a purpose for your life. He has things that He expects you to be able to do, and it's wonderful to be used by God and to be involved in God's plan. And in order to be able to do that effectively, we've got to learn some things. Uh, when I was uh, younger in ministry, I went to a conference uh, down in Florida with the Reverend Dave Williams, and he talked about uh, our calling and our purpose in life having three legs like on a stool. Two legs falls over. You need all three legs in order to be productive in our purpose from God. And those three things were the practical things we need to learn, the spiritual things that we need, and the attitudinal things. So let's say that God is calling you to lead a small group, some simple thing like that. Well, practically speaking, you need to be able to get along with people. You need to have a space that people can meet in. You need to know how to organize a small group and get curriculum and all those sorts of things. There's just some practical things that you need to do. Then spiritually, you need to be in a place where you uh, are confident with who you are in Christ, and so you can feel, facilitate a discussion without being threatened, and you need to also be able to answer certain questions in the right way, and just spiritually be developed in, the, in that good place. And then you have to have a good attitude. Let's say there's a person that's difficult to deal with, and then you just start yelling at them. Uh, that's a bad attitude, or one day you just wake up and you just don't feel like having your small group, so you just uh, throw a fit and don't you know, don't open your door when people come, that sort of thing. You know, you have to be able to develop the practical skills, the spiritual, uh, get into that spiritual place, and then also have the right attitude. So as you grow in these things, your life gets better and your ability to serve the Lord gets better. And that's why God expects us to change, even though He loves us right where we're at. Another question that I received is this. Is the pattern the same for everyone, that God calls them like Peter. We talked about Peter. God calls them so they quit their job and then they uh, get taught by God and then they have this different opportunities in a controlled environment and then they're released to become a great evangelist apostle. Is that pattern the same for everyone? And uh, clearly, of course, we're not all supposed to be Peter, so the pattern is different for everyone. There is a calling on everyone's life, but most people at that first step have a different experience than Peter. Peter left everything. He walked away from fishing the day that Jesus called him to follow him and become a fisher of men. For most people, once you say, yes, Lord, I'm in, I'm going to walk with you and live my life for you, you don't quit your job. You keep your job. You keep your same house, you keep your same family, you're living the same life, but you're living that life in a different way. Most people aren't called to go into the ministry and become a pastor or to become a missionary and go to Africa or some other 
a foreign field and serve the Lord in that capacity, most people are called to fully devote their lives to Christ and keep the same life, but just live it in a different way. So still going to the same job, but now being a light for Christ at that job. Instead of being someone who has a bad attitude and who is a negative influence on people, instead you go to your job and you're a light for Christ in your workplace. You lead by example in how you uh, work hard and do an excellent job and then uh, you have the ability to speak life into people in your workplace. Also, uh, you know, as far as becoming a great evangelist apostle like Peter was. He had that opportunity on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 to be able to address a massive crowd of people and have an incredible impact seeing 3,000 people come to Christ at one time. Just an amazing, amazing day. It's most likely that your experience of serving God is going to be much simpler than that. You might be someone who, you know, regularly attends church, gives faithfully, and serves in a particular area like being a youth leader or teaching Sunday school or helping with the broadcast team at Good Hope or any of those sorts of things. But in general, most people, they're going to dedicate their life to Christ but keep their same job and become a faithful servant of Christ in this normal life. Well, that's the conclusion of our time now talking about Rise Up. We've answered a few questions and dealt with that concept of getting better in our faith and our progression with God over time. If you've enjoyed this uh, sermon series, I encourage you to come visit us. One of the things that's been neat about having people see us on the CW is then sometimes people will come to church and they'll say, Hi, Pastor Mike, I saw you on the CW. So, very uh, happy to have some of you come and visit us, and I'd love to see some more of you, but I want to thank you for watching and just pray encouragement and blessing over you. So God bless you. Have a wonderful day.